So the black pigeon has come to shit all over us. Let's see how this goes. If women's sexual preferences are liberated and go unchecked, they destroy civilizations. If creating biological offspring is the most important thing in life, then I guess you could say that. Is that the most important thing to you in life? I think that it's an important part of life, but it's not necessarily what everyone thinks is the most important thing in life. Now, when it comes to a nation surviving, you forget about the other end, which is overpopulation. You don't even consider this at all. Now, I understand there are some other things that go into this, like cultures coming in who think it's cool to have seven or eight children uh, while we're in the mindset of not uh, contributing to overpopulation, and maybe that comes into the place, but otherwise, uh, what? If women are allowed to choose, harems form. A harem is defined as follows. The separate part of a Muslim household reserved for wives, concubines, and female servants. The wives of a polygamous man. A group of female animals sharing a single mate. If women are allowed a voice in matters that pertain to the safety of a nation, then that nation will die, inevitably. Oh, inevitably, huh? Oh, I suppose you'll go on to prove this, yes, no? It's as simple as that. Once you realize this, you understand the entire basis behind civilized society. Where's my Kool-Aid? I mean, you've got yours. So, where's mine? Do I get some too? And if not, you'll understand by the end of this video. Women do not, on an instinctual level, care very much about her tribe, nation, or civilization. It's in their nature not to. Can I maybe get some proof? You know, proof? Some actual, like, proof? Women are biological creatures, like all others, and they seek to maximize their chances of having viable offspring. It seems that you are arguing that what we are capable of is completely limited to what our biological evolutionary function is. This half-century-long experiment of women's liberation and political enfranchisement has ended in disaster for the West. D-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-d-
all this sort of thing. No. This is borne out across every civilization throughout history. So to be clear, I am not assigning any quote-unquote blame on any group or gender in this video. But you are, Blanche, you are. I'm only trying to explain how I see the world that we've all inherited. And let's get this out in the open. Women are not very good at being loyal to the tribe. They never have been, they never will be. The reason is it's not in their nature to do so. Women throughout history have shown time and time again they're quick to seek the favors of men they feel are stronger and more dominant, whether they're part of their in-group or not. Recent examples of this besides Japanese or Vietnamese war brides come from Europe and are illustrated by the countless numbers of Belgian, French, Dutch, what have you, women that took up relations with occupying German military personnel. And this was only a short time ago, but when Nazis were defeated and social stability was restored, they were punished for their betrayal and transgressions against their people. Guys don't have to pass laws with their dicks, and women don't have to pass laws with their vaginas. If you think that there aren't a lot of guys out there who would want to get with the women of the enemy, um, you're out of your mind. Now, not only are women not punished for inviting alien and unassimilatable armies of men into the West... I'd put this more on the feminists and the SJWs, which aren't always women. But earlier you were saying you don't blame this on women. You don't blame this on one gender. Well, here you're showing that you lied. They then vote for parties that force the entire society to have its national wealth redistributed to this army of aggressive and hostile men. Not all women are feminists, and not all women are SJWs, and there are a number of women out there who are very much against the crap that's been going on. And women who are in positions of power even openly celebrate the destruction that they bring upon their people, and openly taunt those that seek to retain their culture and civilization from obliteration. As in the following video of German politician Dr. Steffi von Berg in Hamburg. Frau Präsidentin, meine Damen und Herren, unsere Gesellschaft wird sich ändern. Unsere Stadt wird sich radikal verändern. Ich bin der Auffassung, dass wir in 20, 30 Jahren gar keine ethnischen Mehrheiten mehr haben in unserer Stadt. Das ist das, was wir haben werden in der Zukunft. Und ich sage Ihnen noch ganz deutlich, gerade hier in Richtung rechts, das ist gut so. I agree with you that what she is saying is bullshit, it's tripe, it's horrible, it's fucking awful. Some people seem to be of this strange mindset that extreme diversity, where you have beliefs that are opposites of each other, can somehow live in perfect harmony. Ebony and ivory. No, it, it doesn't work that way. That's, that's not how things work when it comes to belief systems that are polar opposites of each other. When it comes to cultures that do not work with each other. It, it, it doesn't work that way. This is not a good thing. People have to have some sort of integration going on. There has to be a certain amount of assimilation or things are fucked up. But you can't sit there and blame this on women. Just because this, this bitch is a woman doesn't mean that that's something that women in general want to shove forth. I don't know where you're getting this shit from. And as our societies become ever more dangerous because of people like Ms. Von Berg, and even though women can take steps to protect themselves, the primary responsibility for protection will probably always belong to men. This is very important. Women will thus only have as much freedom as their men are willing or capable of guaranteeing them. If there were more feminists out there who were pushing forth that women actually need to be strong, instead of this idea that they need constant protections and need special considerations according to the law, then maybe that wouldn't have to be the case. But the way that it's going now, yeah, you're, you're right. So the question begs, why do women do this? Why do women betray their in-group? But you are, Blanche, you are. 
And how is the current situation different from those that preceded it? Well, in a word, enfranchisement. Women have been given the vote, and in a democratic society, they vote their biological imperative. So you're saying that women vote with their vaginas. Only the women who believe that way. But not everyone votes with their vaginas, just like not all guys vote with their dicks. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, recent genetic research has shown that before the modern era, 80% of women managed to reproduce while only 40% of men did. The obvious conclusion from this is that a few top men had access to multiple women while the bottom 60% of men had no mating prospects at all. Women clearly didn't mind sharing the top man with a dozen other women, ultimately deciding that being one of many women sharing a man who leads was still more preferable than having the undivided attention of a man who serves. This could be true, but guys would prefer that they could just go around fucking as many women as they possibly could. So, I mean... Commenting on this, Roy Baumeister, a prominent social psychologist who teaches at Florida State University, had this to say. It would be shocking if these vastly different reproductive odds for men and women failed to produce some personality differences. He went on, For women, the optimal thing to do is to go along with the crowd, be nice, play it safe. The odds are good that a man will come along and offer sex and you'll be able to have babies. All that matters is choosing the best offer were descended from women who played it safe. For men, the outlook was radically different. If you go along with the crowd and play it safe, the odds are you won't have children. Most men who ever lived did not have any descendants who are alive today. Their lines were dead ends. Hence, it was necessary to take chances, try new things, be creative, explore other possibilities. Aren't there other mammals who have that same thing going on? Many societies, including the West, long ago devised a simple plan to stop the inherent infighting that occurs because a large majority of men in the in-group don't have sexual access to women or the ability to reproduce legitimate children. This is still suggesting that the only purpose in life is to reproduce and that you don't have any other worth any other way. Now, as a gay man, I've had to put a lot more thought into this than your normal straight person. Because these are questions that go through my head, and they go through just about every gay man's head. The entire basis of Western society was the male agreement to keep only one woman in public, so that every male has near equal chance at reproduction. It's for this reason that organized and advanced civilizations have always needed to agree on the equitable distribution of women, so as to incentivize its men to produce and have a stake in the society's health and security. Technology, standards of living, not everyone wants kids. Not everyone revolves their entire life around their biological evolutionary imperative. That's not all that life is. But this, like other cultural arrangements that held the West together for centuries, is breaking down. And none of the things that I mentioned are things that you've considered. Okay, we don't have to live the way that we have in the past. We don't have to live that way. We can, but why? And can be observed in something as basic as the fact there are no Western countries that are even at replacement levels in their birth rates. Even in countries that have a reasonable amount of diversity, but not too much, if you put too many people there, if they populate too much... They're harder to govern. It's harder for people to feel like they can be themselves. And we have that rats in a cage syndrome where you put too many rats in the cage and they end up killing each other. That's just how it goes. You don't want overpopulation either. So you're, again, going into this idea that our only purpose is to populate. This, again, can be laid at the feet of loosening of sexual morality and the dating habits of young women. Colloquially called the 80-20 rule, what it basically means is that the vast majority, the 80%, are sexually pursuing the top 20% of men. This is highly damaging to the formation of monogamous couples and the successful formation of families. So you are purely a traditionalist. You believe in the types of relationships that 
uh, religious people tend to believe in. You don't believe in polyamory. You don't believe in alternate types of ways of raising kids, like in a commune or having a village raise people. It's got to be this traditional kind of thing, and, and that's the only way. And well, you know, we've given this 50 years and it's failing, so so let's just toss all of it out, toss the baby out with the bathwater and, you know, start going back to what we were before because I can't think of anything else and, and things are falling apart and it's all women's fault, but you are Blanche. And the children that will be the next generation of any given country. Also, one thing to understand is that female psychology has always been about adaptation. In our tribal past, if women of conquered tribes didn't submit to their new masters, they faced death along with their husbands, brothers, sons, fathers. Even today, many women seek out aggressive men, whether consciously or not, as it seems that this psychology has been ground into women after countless years of our species' evolution. That means criminals, gangsters, and mass murderers are always going to be more attractive to women than hard-working, honest men. They always have been, they always will be. I'm sure there's some truth to what you're saying there, but another consideration is that people want excitement. They don't want to spend the rest of their life with someone whom they can pretty much guess how things are going to go. This isn't just a women thing. Of course, maybe, uh, maybe that's a thing that's also with gay men. Maybe there's that element to it. Um, gay men do have some different thinking patterns, different brain scans that are seen. So, and it is more close to what women tend to like. Uh, so I guess I'm speaking for myself in that, hey, it, it's kind of a, a neat idea to be with someone who things are not going to be boring. So... Now, as far as my belief about uh, the genetic component of homosexuality, it's that if there is a biological component, then it's only a predisposition for. And it will show itself depending on the way the person is raised or just the environment they're around when they're growing up and they reach... Uh, certain years of in sexual development. But in a society where not that many men are able to reproduce, um, I see it as a biological way of saying, hey, you can still enjoy life. Think of how many women throw themselves at drug dealers versus, for example, math teachers. Sexual attraction is based on this reality for many women, regardless of whether they admit it or not. And the feminization of men in the West, adhering to the repetitive and decades-long diatribe that vilifies anything and all things masculine, are no longer, for many women, attractive potential mates. Especially for women in their critical prime childhood-bearing years. But I do add, this may and does change for many with age. The culture of the sensitive man, the emotional man, the compassionate man is at odds with what women are biologically predisposed to desire. Young women, if they tell you the truth, are drawn to the scoundrel, not the impeccable gentleman with the perfectly manicured fingernails. Afraid? You're trembling. I'm not trembling. I'm because I'm a scoundrel. There are no scoundrels in your life. It's so much a part of women's psyche to want the scoundrel that it's wrapped up in their very DNA. This could be true. This very much could be true. But in the kind of society we live in, we're not bound by those types of things. Many people know that if you go for other things, you can achieve longer happiness. But not everyone goes with that, and some people just go with their gut instinct on that, and uh, that's what some of the people go for. You could be totally right about that. 
Just to get this out of the way, because I have a feeling it might show up in the comments, yes, I am aware that the vast majority of women, when raped, reach sexual climax or orgasm. However, from all the science that's been done, this is just basically a hardwired response. That if it does have an effect on women and their judgment, it must do so at a very subconscious or primal level. I also know that the number one sexual fantasy disclosed by women over and over again is rape fantasy forced sex fantasy. But fantasy and reality are two different things. Well, I'm glad you acknowledge that at least. So I'm not really going to count this as a reason why women are so prone to consciously betray their in-group. You are. The half-century-long experiment of women's liberation and political enfranchisement has ended in disaster for the West. When you begin to start connecting the dots, you realize that since women have been given the vote, the entire center of politics and thus Western society has shifted ever more to the left. Oh, poor traditionalists. So, so now you're going to blame this whole thing on the left? Really, dude? Really? Women have also used their political enfranchisement to further the cause of the aptly named women's liberation. Liberation socially, liberation financially, liberation from family, from motherhood, liberation from religious dogma, and most importantly, sexual liberation. Most of those, I think, are a good thing for people to be liberated from. We don't need religious dogma crammed down people's throats. We don't need people suggesting that Enjoying your sexuality is something negative. Um, you know, I mean, the only way that you can look at any of this stuff the way that you do is if you think that our only purpose is to reproduce. Once women were given equal say in the sphere of politics, it was only a matter of time until our civilization was swept up by the event horizon of its own collapse. All kinds of studies have been done on this subject, as this one from Columbia University, and they all, without exception, note that as women become more, quote-unquote, emancipated, the decline of the family is further accelerated. Well, we should be having less kids. We don't need to be putting so many people in the world that they're hard to govern, that they're hard to, to be able to have an enjoyable life. We don't want to overpopulate things, but you seem to think that that's our main purpose. That's all that matters. That's the only thing that matters. No, it's not the only thing that matters. And as the family disintegrates and women move politically further and further to the left in their voting, many then begin to use the government as a surrogate husband and provider. Well, maybe if people like you and Republicans and religious fucktards weren't so busy trying to stop women from using uh, birth control in some way, uh, maybe not as many women would want help from the government raising their kids. Women are thus even more liberated from their traditional roles within the family and society at large. In one of the most comprehensive studies of civilizational decline, J.D. Unwin postulates in his book, Sex and Culture, written in 1934, that the main driver for the rise of a civilization is the degree of chastity of the said civilization's women. So you're basically telling me that you want to drink all this guy's Kool-Aid, right? Unwin, a British social anthropologist at Oxford and Cambridge Universities, studied 86 different cultures through 5,000 years of history and found a positive correlation between the cultural achievement of a people and the sexual restraint they observed. Unwin's impetus for the project was to test the Freudian theory that civilizational progress was the product of repressed sexuality. Something we have now that none of the cultures have had in the past is birth control. Something that you seem to be against because you think our only purpose is to reproduce. Granted, a culture that doesn't reproduce that much is easier to be taken over. He found that discipline in sexual matters appropriated social energy to more civilizational ends. Yay, we built a new building that looks like a penis. Yay! It's very complicated, but for Unwin, the fabric of society was primarily sexual, and heterosexual monogamy was the optimal arrangement for the planning, building, protecting, and nurturing of the family. If enough heterosexual partners made a monogamous commitment, civilizational energy was directed toward promoting the finest societal foundation possible. Now we have technology and knowledge that show that we don't have to do things the way that we've done them in the past. 
Without exception, each civilization he studied allowed its success to alter its moral code. According to Unwin, after a nation becomes increasingly liberal with regards to its sexual morality, it loses its cohesion, its impetus, and its purpose. We create our own purpose. We are not bound by the lowest common denominator of our biological evolutionary imperative. From a chaste moral code, societies gained what he called expansive energy. And this energy allowed these cultures to expand into other weaker cultures. When we become like we've been and like what's happening in Europe, yes, we are easier to conquer. This is true. And the main thing about this is how divided we have become. United we stand, divided we fall. Now when you compare the modern Western world with the Islamic one, you see exactly the results that Unwin's theory would predict. By allowing women to fuck freely, the West has de facto entered a matriarchy that disincentivizes young men. It disincentivizes men from creating families. Islam, on the other hand, keeps their women chaste, and their expansive energy, as Unwin's theory predicts, is manifested in what we're observing today. The Islamic culture is the one who's expanding into the West. Because we're letting them. This is not about women. This is about this idea of multiculturalism. This is about the whole social justice warrior crap. And it was only recently that the West was able to dominate all other cultures on the planet. Ultimately, each civilization became less cohesive, less aggressive, and less resolute. Civilizations in this liminal phase then collapsed from either A, an internal anarchic revolution, or B, conquest by invaders with greater social energy. Terrifyingly, Unwin also noted that there was no case in any of the studies he'd made in which a culture managed to restrict the sexual freedom of women once they'd been loosened. A feminist society and future is an oxymoron, as it's unsustainable in the long run. If feminism continues the route that it has, where it's not just focusing on women, they want to be intersectional third-wave feminists, and the whole SJW shit, yeah, we're, we're not going to survive that if we allow that to continue. I'm hoping that something's going to happen and we're going to say, fuck this shit. Based just on past history, a civilization that embraces feminist values will cease to exist in a very short time. This is why we've never seen a feminist civilization aside from very short spans at the end of great empires. The signs of decline are already observable. While many countries are sliding into social decline, the canary in the coal mine is the self-described humanitarian superpower that pursues a feminist foreign policy. When looking at Sweden, it's one of the most gender equal countries on earth. And while they've become the rape capital of Europe, they're flushing their culture and country down the toilet and pressing forward in their civilizational suicide at an ever-accelerating pace. The total and complete feminization of Sweden and its men have allowed their women to invite their country's own destruction through the importation of millions of unassimilatable and aggressive people from completely alien cultures. Nothing I can say to counter that because that seems to be what's happening. Not only are they borrowing money to fund the colonization of their country, but they are now even creating gender imbalances that will have severe and lasting repercussions on their society's future. And they await their doom with smiles of tolerance and passivity, calm as Hindu cows. Looking again at Unwin's work, he leaves us with a stark dilemma. It may not be possible to save the West. If we can show those who have that SJW mindset how over-the-top ridiculous and outrageous they're being, maybe we can. According to his model, this process is irreversible. And the only way to do so would be to restrict the sexual freedom of Western women. It's obvious that you really dig this guy's concepts and you think his way is the only way. Like some person in a 12-step program saying, N.A. is the only way. There are other ways, but you don't want to look at them. And move back to a more patriarchal society. And as things stand, this is probably an impossibility. Well, I mean, if you want a patriarchy, then just let the Muslims take over and then you'll get exactly what you want, right? So, instead of having it all, Western women risk losing everything. 
What are liberal feminists going to do when faced with aggressive gangs of migrants bent on theft and sexual violence? It'll get that way in Europe, but it's not likely to get that way in the United States. Burn their bras and throw a pocket edition of cunt a declaration of independence at them? The violence now being directed toward Western women in their own countries is undeniable proof of the breakdown of the leftist utopian ideals for society. The million migrants that have already arrived and the millions on their way already understand that the West is a toothless civilization ripe for plunder. Sadly. But I wouldn't blame this on the left in general. I would blame this on the extreme end of the left. While Western women might be the ones advocating, whether knowingly or not, for the destruction of the West via misplaced compassion and hyper-emotionalism, it's also the fault of Western men by giving them the choice and allowing their gender's particular predilections to dictate what our civilization's values, priorities, and ultimately what our future should and will be. As I said many times in this video, not all women are feminists, not all women are social justice warriors. There are plenty of very level-headed women out there who aren't trying to shove forth this shit. So don't make this a thing about women. Uh, but you are, Blanche. And maybe Unwin is right. Maybe there is no peaceful way to resolve this crisis of our civilization. Our feminized society hasn't built an equality rainbow that'll usher the West into a nirvana of peace and security based on mutual respect and tolerance. No, it has succeeded in paving the way for the takeover and Islamization of the West. Ironically, it'll be feminine tendencies and policies that rule our society, if not kept in check, that will bring down the more gender-inclusive states of the West and replace them with the tribalism of Africa and the Middle East, and the hyper-masculinity of Islam. But you don't have a problem with a patriarchy. You don't have a problem with the hyper-masculinity of a culture. You think those are good things. So why are you arguing against Islam? Because their take on it is different? Well, interesting. You seem to be for the uh, strong, conquer kind of mindset everywhere else, but not with Islam, even though you defend many of the things that are principles of Islam. Interesting how that works. Is it just a giant do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do kind of argument you're giving? It seems so. You can have a feminized society, but it won't survive Islam. And here's the crimson red pill of this video. Western men have given Western women freedom of will and choice in their own society. And Western women are now choosing who will take it away from them. It's not just women that are doing this. It is anyone who believes in this multicultural utopia that's impossible. It's the SJWs and it's the intersectional third wave feminists who are doing this. And that's not just women. And not all women do this. So your argument here is kind of messed up and most of it is based off of the philosophies of a very small handful of people. But, you know, keep pushing the hate on women and then claim that's not what you're doing. But you are, Blanche. You are.